Hello, you're welcome to a discourse in Conversations with God, published and written by Neil Donald Walsh. However, as all artists know, we are but vessels for our creations. And uh, Neil talks about this at the very first chapter of this book and how this whole circumstance of him becoming an author came about. Skipping ahead well into the first book of, uh, I don't know how many books, there's three main books and they total a very lengthy audio trip if you're ever up for a fantastic conversation about what is important in reality, life and the circumstance of what we do with each other in society, then it's definitely something you should check out. Uh, obviously, this is just for purely entertainment purposes. I have and do not own any rights uh, to Conversations with God or Neil Donald Walsh in any capacity. My intent and my um, goal here is to elucidate more conversation around the important materials that are raised in these subjects so you may go out and uh, invest in your own education a bit more about subjects that matter to you. Chapter 8 is what we're talking about today in the first book, Chapter 8 has a very relative subject that we're all very fascinated in, at the very least, the vast majority of us, uh, and that is all about relationships. So this happens in a conversation basis between Neil and God. Okay, so that's the structure of it. So there's a couple of, it starts off with a question, and, and then there's a couple of comments through the content from Neil as the content keeps going, uh, conversation with God keeps going. So um, I'll do the best I can to guide you through it so it's not too alien and not too foreign. You'll catch on pretty quick as to what's going on in the conversation between the two of them. However, also I'm going to stop here and then add and interject and talk about uh, particular parts as we go through. So that's what this is about, is the discussion around the contents of the book, not so much. Um, for you to find a cheap way to get a hold of this information. The internet is amazing. Get out there, get a hold of this Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh, amongst many other fantastic um, materials that are out there. And uh, we'll hopefully have more little gems for you come up in the coming months and years on my channels. So, chapter eight. Neil starts off by asking, when will I learn enough about relationships to be able to have them go smoothly? Is there a way to be happy in relationships? Must they constantly be challenging? God goes on, you have nothing to learn about relationships. You have only to demonstrate what you already know. There is a way to be happy in relationships and that is to use relationships for, the, for their intended purpose, not the purpose you have designed. Relationships are constantly challenging constantly calling you to create, express, and experience higher and higher aspects of yourself, grander and grander visions of yourself, ever more magnificent versions of yourself. Nowhere can you do this more immediately, impactfully, and immaculately than in relationships. In fact, without relationships, you cannot do it at all. It is only through your relationships with other people, places, and events that you can even exist as a knowable entity, as an identifiable something in this universe. Remember, absent everything else, you are not. You only are what you are relative to another thing that is not. That is how it is in the world of relative as opposed to the world of the absolute where I reside. Once you clearly understand this, once you deeply grasp it, then you intuitively bless each and every experience, all human encounter and especially personal human relationships, for you see them as constructive in the highest sense. You see that they can be used, must be used, and are being used, whether you want them to be or not, to construct who you really are. That construction can be a magnificent creation of your own conscious design, or a strictly happenstance configuration. You can choose to be a person who has resulted simply from what has happened, or from what you've chosen to be and do about what has happened. It is in the later form that creation of self becomes conscious. It is in the second experience 
that self becomes realized. Bless therefore every relationship and hold each as special and formative of who you are and now choose to be. So a couple of very quick things while we press pause on the reading. That is how it is in the world of the relative as opposed to the world of the absolute where I reside. So this, what we call universe, life or existence, has a few understandable designs about it. One of them is that you're born and you die, for instance. Um, in the other realm, I'm not talking about dimensions of our universe, I'm talking about like completely on the flip side of our entire universe is where we would call, you know, heaven, God, or, or whatever you want to dub that as. That is a place of absoluteness, of unity, where things have no separation and things have no designation as they are all God, right? So everything here in our universe, as Einstein put it in our Western cultural civilization um, reference frame point, is relativity. That the universe at its most functional levels is a relative function to itself. What this means is that nothing exists separate from anything else, that everything is connected, but it is only connected and defined by the connections that create that definition. Okay? A jigsaw piece of, a jigsaw puzzle piece is only a jigsaw puzzle piece because it was cut for the relative purpose of being a piece in a puzzle. And so it typically takes the shape that you hold now in your mind of a jigsaw puzzle piece. Yes, technically we can have jigsaw puzzle pieces any shape or design that we want. But for the sake of conversation, that's the point, is anything can be used in its informed idealistic potential, or it can be reduced to its base elements. So a jigsaw puzzle piece could just be a piece that could be used for anything, and at that point it could be a particle, a square, a diamond, a piece of something, um, an element or whatever, and I'm getting way off the track here, but this is really important to remember, is that where we are is the world of the relative. And while everything is connected and as one, it is the relative position of things that give shape and form to everything else. Without darkness, there is no light. Without the ability to hate, there is no such thing as embrace and love. You know, There is these dichotomies that exist, and that's what relativity is. The universe is relative, not empirical. Okay, so what we have is not one thing and the opposite, like hot and cold. What we have is temperature. And the experience of temperature is a relative circumstance. Hot and cold is not one part of that thermometer. It is a relative position. If you go where you are in your body temperature, then anything above that is hotter and anything below that is colder. If you double your body temperature, anything above that is now hotter and anything below that is now colder. Then depending upon the definition of your body, say human flesh that usually has a frame of reference and construction of this particular energetic environment, like temperature, if you were to relatively go outside of your reference frame, you would find trouble and disorganization, which is hotter temperatures causing your flesh to melt, come apart, or colder temperatures causing your flesh to come together in ways that it is no longer flesh, but instead a solidified, solid chunk of what we usually call ice. So, very important that we understand that we're talking about a world of relativity. Our world, not a world of empirical facts, which is a deluded scientific concept that is pushed and shoved through media, corporate enterprise, and business to make you feel depressed, anxious, and full of anxiety, uh, doubly anxious and doubly full of anxiety. So that way you go out and buy things in order to be good uh, you know, citizens to increase your GDP, to show how political parties are actually taking credit for everybody who is doing the things that they're taking credit for, going off subject again. 
getting back onto the particular questions, God comes back and says, now your inquiry has to do with individual human relationships of the romantic sort. And I understand that. So let me address myself specifically and at length to human love relationships, these things which continually give, su give you such trouble. When human relationships fail, relationships of course never truly fail, except in a strictly human sense that they did not produce what you want, they fail because they were entered into for the wrong reasons. Wrong, of course, is a relative term, as well as the rest of the things in this universe. That's my little comment there, as a reminder of the relativeness of our reality. Meaning something measured against that which is right, whatever that so happens to be. It would be more accurate in your language to say relationships fail or change, most often when they are entered into for reasons not wholly beneficial or conducive to their survival. Most people enter into relationships with an eye toward what they can get out of them rather than what they can put into them. The purpose of relationship is to decide what part of yourself you'd like to see show up, not what part of another you can capture and hold. There can only, there can be only one purpose for relationships and for all of life, which is to be and to decide who you really are. The only purpose for anything is to be and decide who you really are in reference to that. So this is a big one right here. When human love relationships fail, we have the expectation in our society most people consider a successful love relationship, romantic relationship, to be defined by a time period, usually many years or, in fact, an entire lifetime. Some of us talk about, in reference to older generations and movies and stories, about being with one person until we die in each other's arms. And while these ideas are wonderfully romantic, they're not exactly accurate as to the best measuring stick for a successful relationship. For example, what's the point in spending 60 years with somebody that you hate, despise, and can't bear to be in the same bed with? Hmm. But this takes awareness of ourselves and the circumstance, and this is why we're having a discussion about all of this. Wrong of course, being a relative term to that, to which is right. So if we set our intention at the beginning of a relationship to say, well, our relationship is going to be one of producing fantastic children and enjoying the flavors of life together, celebrating the creation of all that is, then every day could potentially become exactly that. Whereas we've got a lot of toxic programming in our society, especially around the concept of marriage, that marriage is an elongated thing. It is not a necessarily successfully happy thing. And you can tell this by the unconscious jokes that we use to disperse the buildup of stress that we all experience. Like the ball and chain of marriage. Like the, well, we're married, so we don't have any sex anymore. There is so many culturally... I'm going to use the word inappropriate, in my opinion, jokes that we make about being married that cause us to expect a more negative time than what it was prior to getting married. So if we're setting this, as in a negative experience, as right, and then we're experiencing that 20 years down the path from now, sitting on the couch going, why is my relationship not what I had always dreamt it to be? Maybe it's because somewhere along the line we'd settled for something less, right? And we're going to get into more detail here. Another really important part I wanted to point out here is I toward what they can get out of other people rather than what they can put into them. Stop being so selfish in terms of claiming from other people and be selfish in terms of your own standing, and that'll come in context very soon. But relationships are not a way for you to possess other people or to possess concepts or to possess things that you adorn your life with like 
bajangles on the back of your handbag. Okay? We are, you are, and your partner is a living creative expression of divinity itself exploring its own potentials. Okay? That is not something that you can cage and claim as your own. Okay? So it's not about what somebody else is and you holding on to that, this idea. It is about you deciding what part of yourself, as they say, you'd like to see show up in those circumstances. Okay? Who, who do you want to be? What choices are you making in your relationship? Are you coming home every night and sitting on the couch and complaining about the fact that you're exhausted and watching TV and then complaining about the fact that nothing happens and the, the relationship is getting stale? Or are you stimulating energetic connection, thus reinvigorating the relationship, extending what we call the honeymoon effect, which is not a certain amount of time. It can be a permanent state. A somewhat permanent state, as any state is not permanent. Now, for instance, a waking state is broken by sleeping states. So, as a basic example, your happy life state is going to be broken by a sleep state here and there, let alone a, a poo state <laughs> every now and then, obviously. Continuing on, it is very romantic to say that you were nothing until that special other came along, but it is not true. Worse, it puts an incredible pressure on the other to be all sorts of things he or she is not. So not wanting to let you down, they try very hard to be and do these things until they cannot anymore. They can no longer complete your picture or your idea of them. They can no longer fill the roles to which they have been assigned. Resentment builds and anger follows. Usually, also, we don't identify the resentment building or the anger building because we don't want to admit to ourselves that we're becoming resentful of our partner. We're married. We're a husband. We are a wife. We are a whatever you would like to call yourself under that circumstance. We are there meant to be loving. So why am I finding myself resenting them? Why is it that I can only just glare at him while he sits on the couch and does nothing. Goes on to say, I, did, uh, I had a bit of a divergence there. Goes on to say, finally, in order to save themselves, resentment builds, anger follows. Finally, in order to save themselves and the relationship itself, these special others begin to reclaim their real selves, acting more in accordance with who they really are. And it is about this time that you say, They've really changed. Now, this is something many of us experience and talk about in relationships. I'm diverging from the material again here. In the sense that we know that after the, quote, honeymoon period has ended, the real relationship begins. That is, after we have exhausted our efforts in pretending to be the best version of ourselves that we think somebody else wants, we then get exhausted and start being unable to maintain that facade and instead experience the older self coming back out of ourselves again in order to be able to deal with the stresses and the recuperation and the recovery of all of this. And at this point, we now are somebody else than who started the relationship. So the partner that we have then looks at us and goes, what, well, so, okay, how, why, why have you changed? You've just become a completely different... This, you've never been like this. Why is this now important to you? Well, actually, it's likely it's always been important. It's just the individual that is now declaring this has kept it suppressed. And they don't know how to say, look, um, when we started this relationship, I was a complete idiot to myself. And I had no idea who or what I wanted. And so I, all I did was I tried to be the best version of myself that I could be for you. Because I really wanted to impress you. Because I really like you. Now I'm finding out that these parts that are coming out of me are integral to me in who I am experiencing myself as I'm at the moment. Side note, you can change these things at the same time given the right approach. But these things usually start coming out because we're yeah, getting to that point where we're feeling trapped. Okay. Continuing on. 
goes on to say again, it is very romantic to say that now that your special other has entered your life, you feel complete, yet the purpose of relationships is not to have another who might complete you, but to have another with whom you might share your completeness. Okay. I am a Virgo by birth, uh, according to regular 12 sign astrology. Um, I consider myself to be very romantic and very ideally um, charged towards um, these concepts of martyrdom and identification with the purity of sacrifice, what should be, or what is usually considered to be the purity of sacrifice. Like Jesus, you know, nobody turns around and says, oh no, don't, don't give me any of that. Everybody's like, yeah, cool, that's, that's awesome, way to go, thank you for that. You know, so it's not in terms of me trying to be romantic or me trying to be um, sacrificial in order to be able to get a debt of somebody that I can use over them. It is so that way I can do the best I can to try to be what I thought I should be. And what that was, was built off of the movies, books and media of the time. So I was raised by a single mum and she was... Um, having a bit of a rough time with my father when he left and as such she jumped into romantic content and things like this before the internet. Used to read a lot of Danielle Steele and used to raise uh, me and my brothers with the idea of generating men who would be aware of the importance of romanticism. So we are all in my family aware of the fact that we should be romantic with one another and not expect cold relationships. Um, but at the same time, I just so happen to have taken it a bit more seriously and have tried to sacrifice myself in relationships many times up until this point. In fact, the only time that I can say that I had a really successful in terms of me being me relationship was when I met somebody and the agreements that we made when we started a relationship was not, hey, I think you're really hot, you want to fuck, uh, was more, oh, well, excuse me, the language uh, was more along the lines of and I'm Australian so it's cultural reference language by the way um, was more along the lines of okay you're running a business I'm running a business we're both trying to help and change the world let's do it together and have fun and enjoy it as a celebration while we do and I can tell you that that relationship transformed not only my life but transformed the view that many people around me have of what is potentially possible in a relationship. We had my previous partner who passed away, uh, and I, we had people who would tell us, oh, you know, we wish that we were like you two, you know, can you help us to learn to be like you two and other things like this. Goes on to say back to the material. Here is the paradox of all human relationships. You have no need for a particular other in order for you to experience fully who you are and yet without another you are nothing so while you do not need anyone to experience who you fully are in all of your completeness you can't do that in an environment away from everything else. It is impossible for you to do it disconnected from the rest of humanity. Gone. Try to find a place anywhere that you're not going to be impacted by other people on the planet. We are now that global that everything impacts everywhere. Rubbish is being found in Antarctica. Pollution is being found at places that we never have really experienced expected pollution to be found i'm not talking about yeah obviously there's trace elements of all sorts of things in all sorts of places that are a discourse of air current moving um chemicals and particles all over the place but i'm talking about you know yeah mappable observable differences in environments that have changed because of the uh, growth of society and that's usually why people think that there's a limitation on how many people are potentially available to exist all at one time because we can't have a place that lasts forever this is a finite surface or planet or whatever you want to call it it's a finite area in which we have to play in and there's no area in this play that we can find that is separate from everyone else 
So it's a, it's a fantastically bizarre paradox, which is that, you know, you can't do this by yourself, literally, but you kind of have to do it by yourself before you do it with somebody else. That is to say that you, you're not, not meant to enter, meant to enter into a relationship with somebody else before you love yourself. There's a few memes that are going around on Facebook at the moment talking about how we're not meant to tell people to love themselves before they enter into a relationship. Well, um, think of it more like this. The more that you know yourself and the more that you know you want what you want, the more accurate you'll get from other people. If you don't know what you want, if you don't know how to get what you want, then you're in a position where you can either pull back, retract, and do some research, exploration, and study into these things as to what you want, or you could jump into the deep end, go find a relationship, and get ready for a rocky wild ride. It might work out that you're one in a million, and you end up marrying the person for the next 90 years before you both die in a beautiful newspaper article together. Or you might find that it's a temporary relationship while you go through the transformative processes of learning who you are, what you are, as you grow up. Yeah. Me, in this recording at this particular time, in the year of 2022, November, I'm... God, I need to actually work this out. Um, 37. I'm 37 this year. And... Every year that I have, I'm constantly reflecting back on the previous years going, wow, I thought I had it all figured out then, but <laughs> well, if I knew back then what I knew now, well, blimey, jeez, you know, so we've got this constant hindsight um, paradox as well, which is, is that we think we have perfect vision right now, but 20 years after now, we'll look back and go, <laughs> oh, I was such a child, <laughs> how naive I was. Anyway, back to the material. This is both the mystery and the wonder, the frustration and the joy of the human experience. It requires deep understanding and total willingness to live within this paradox in a way which makes sense. I observe that very few people do. Most of you enter into relationships uh, in your forming years, ripe with anticipation, full of sexual energy, a wide open heart, and a joyful, if eager, soul. Somewhere between 40 and 60, and for most it is sooner rather than later, you've given up on your grandest dream, set aside your highest hope, and settled for your lowest expectation, or nothing at all. The problem is so basic, so simple, and yet so tragically misunderstood. Your grandest dream, your highest idea, and your fondest hope has had to do with your beloved other than with your beloved self. The test of your relationships has had to do with how well the other has lived up to your ideas and how well you saw yourself living up to his or her ideas. Yet, the only true test has to do with how well you live up to your own ideas. What is the point of living up to somebody... This is diverging from the material again. What is the point of living up to somebody else's ideals? If that is not who you are, you'll spend your whole life in resentment. If not of them, of yourself, because you don't have the guts to step out and say, actually, no, I don't like that. Can we please stop doing that? That, that, that hurts me. Right? So this is where we start to see that rather than sacrificing ourself for somebody else, we're starting to shift the focus onto the self in a lot more detail. But it's not in the self of sacrificing others in order for us to consume and become more. It is in the liberation of ourselves and our inner awareness fields. So that way we can then be more aware of our relative position with everything else around us. The content goes on to say, relationships are sacred because they provide life's grandest opportunity, indeed its only opportunity, to create and produce the experience of your highest conceptualization of self. Relationships fail when you see them as life's grandest opportunity to create and produce the experience of your highest conceptualization of another. 
I've worked with people who have had relationships where they've been doing everything that they can for the other person and they're frustrated because they don't understand why the other person doesn't want it. But this is good and it's a good thing and it's what they want and it's what they need is being said and yet the person who it's being done to turns around and says no 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 it's not how we see what other people need it's how we see what we need and what we will settle for but this is a fantastic point because to create and produce experience of your highest conceptualization of self okay Relationships, as it was mentioned early, earlier, are challenging. Constantly calling you to create, express, and experience higher and higher aspects of yourself, grander and grander visions of yourself, ever more magnificent versions of yourself. Now, this is an opportunity to see it as that. Equally, what that means in our current ecological circumstance in the environments of community and societal context that I'm aware of in our, where I am, Western Australian uh, perspective. What that usually means is, is that a partner is just always going to complain. Nothing is ever going to be good enough and there's no real point to anything because it's all just going to be a challenge anyway. So why not just sit on my butt, go to work, watch TV, Maybe play some games when I come home, go out clubbing on the weekend, get laid, go buy some sex toys to satisfy myself with. Cool. You know, that's, that's a, I, I can have a happy life like that. A happy life. But equally, if I was the grandest version of myself, the most magnificent expression of myself, I would have a happy life as well. So if one is happy and the other is happy, well... What's the difference? Well, clearly one of them is an acceptance of a lower form, and one of them is an expression of the lack of settling for the lowest form. When we find ourselves in a state of depression and anxiety and hopelessness, and all of these other things that we experience on a regular basis in most people's households, we find ourselves reluctantly delaying and foregoing transformational opportunity in order to seek out what we usually call pleasure comforts. These are our addictions, our vices. Addictions and vices are not chemical based, although chemicals clearly have a impact on the environment and the circumstance as to what's going on. But think about it like this. If everything was based in chemicality, then just I'm pretty sure I just made up a word there. Chemicality, chemical reality, then all things that have no chemicals would therefore be non-addictive. As a classic example, say poker machines or slot machines, gambling. Gambling is highly addictive and it's not because you're drinking alcohol at the same time. It is because you're experiencing a rush and flood of chemicals within your own brain. So it is your own inner pharmacology that we become addicted to in our vices and we become addicted to these inner pharmacological vices because we haven't set up the parameters and the structures within our brain to produce these same chemicals from regular life processes. For example, modern neurology is talking about an interesting concept in raising children. Uh, where they're talking about micro-reactions. These are reactions that are unmediated by any sort of conscious capacity. That is, uh, if I recall, it was point one, two, four of a second, or could even be point zero, one to four, but we'll stay with point one, two, four of a second, okay? That is just over a tenth of a second. One tenth of a second. Okay, get a second counter and look at how many or how fast a tenth of a second passes by. It'll pass by and then after it's passed by, you'll realize that it's passed by and you'll be like, okay, stop. And it'll already be two or three past what you want it to stop at, right? That is because these things take time in order to do, in order to grow. And I forget where I was now, but...
Oh man, and I get the feeling that was a really good point to explore. It'll come back to me, I'm sure. But this is the grand opportunity that we have to experience life as ourselves. Oh, I'm talking about, yeah. So how we experience moments in time, as an example. Parents have been recorded listening to their own and other babies' cries, and within this frame of immediate reaction, science has collated data, and the data suggests that a healthily organized brain in a parent actually feels happiness and an increase in what we refer to as positive hormonal activity within the biology of a human, not just the brain, but also through the biology, your gut system, your heart, all of these things produce and move hormones all about your body for the parent. Now, let me ask you a question. What parent do you know gets happy when their child cries? Now, let me ask you another question. What parent do you know gets agitated and frustrated when, they cry, when their child cries? I'm not talking about a legitimate circumstance where the child is going through some sort of extreme accident. It could just be crying over something that they're, you know, what we would classically refer to as whinging about. Right? Whinging of a baby or a child is completely different from adult whinging as well. We view these things completely different. But these tests show that given the right structure, which is neuroscience, neuroplasticity, belief management, stress management, subconscious um, building and working, unconscious building and working, then what we have is an environment where conflict, competition, um, problems that we encounter on a regular basis become invigorating for us. They give us energy in order to deal with the circumstance at hand. But we all tend to have this opinion that we can't deal with complicated, um, maybe not complicated, but conflicting or challenging circumstances when we don't have enough energy. We just want to sort of sit down and relax and not do anything until we recharge again. This mentality of seeking comfort is what we do by ourselves. So if you're like me, you might find that in a relationship, you're a lot more proactive towards your own mental, psychological health and looking after yourself than what you are by yourself, because you tend to make more destructive decisions by yourself, you know, because it doesn't really matter. Nobody's watching or you know, whatever. I just don't have time, blah, blah, blah. Whereas in a relationship with another, it is a constant challenge. It is a constant back and forth like that, which given the right neural structure becomes an inviting opportunity for us to become and express our grandest opportunity, which again, I want to emphasize is not a challenge in endurance or effort, but a grand opportunity to express love, joy, connection, emotion, and, and I want to use the word attachment, but we usually have a negative context with that one. Moving on with the material. Let each person in a relationship worry about the self, what self is being, doing, and having, what self is wanting, asking, giving, what self is seeking, creating, and experiencing. Lost my place in pages then. And all relationships would magnificently serve their purpose and their participants. Let each person in relationship not worry about the other, but only, only, only about themselves. Now, obviously, if you're caring for somebody who has a lack of physical capacity or mental, emotional capacity, uh, you know, might be in a wheelchair, then clearly you need to modify that statement for your circumstance. You need to worry about, well, not worry, but you need to, be aware of the other person and their needs and how you're impacting and helping them with their needs. But generally speaking, I don't want you to tell me what's going to make me happy. I will tell you what's going to make me happy. And I expect the same from you, for you to know what is going to make you happy and for you to know how and when you want that. We have also a historical thing in our society where we talk about 
uh, being careful what we wish for from a genie because people usually don't know what they want. And this is the reason why you've got to go into the investment of finding out who you are. Know thyself, as they say. When you know yourself, you know primarily what you don't want. Okay, And this is the dichotomy of the relative universe that we exist in. What you don't want. I don't want to be treated with disrespect. I don't want to be ignored. I don't want to be treated like I'm some sort of last choice. Right? All of these things have their place. However, the place needs to be investigated as to whether or not it's, a, it's coming from a place of hurt, pain, and traumatic response due to unconscious, subconscious programming? Or is it coming from the opportunity for us to express ourselves in who we see ourselves are in that moment? I hold doors open for people sometimes. I do not want people to say, I mean, we, we all kind of want to be appreciated every now and then, but generally speaking, I do not want people to say thank you for the things that I do for them. That is not the reason why I'm doing it. You know, I want you to be grateful and to experience a joyous life, and this is great. But at the same time, I'm very empirical about the fact that I'm being generous because I am generous. I'm not being generous because I'm creating a debt that makes you indebted to me, and so you've got to repay that debt in either being kind and generous to me or by saying certain magical words to me. Like, thank you. Oh my God, I'm so grateful that you held that door open for me. Couldn't give you rat's bottom about it. Bottom. Um, it's much more about me taking the opportunity to express my desire to be of service. And that's a selfish actualization that results in a compassionate circumstance for those around me. It's an interesting circumstance. Moving on with the material. Let each person in a relationship worry not about the other, but only, only, only about the self. This seems a strange teaching for you of being told that in the highest form of relationships, that one worries only about the other. Yet, I tell you this, your focus upon the other, your obsession with the other, is what causes a relationship to fail. What is the other being? What is the other doing? What is the other having? What is the other saying, wanting, demanding? What is the other thinking? What is the other expecting? What is the other planning? The master understands that it does not matter what the other is being, doing, having, saying, wanting, demanding. It doesn't matter what the other is thinking, expecting, or planning. It only matters what you are being in relationship to that. What are you relative to the things that are going on around you. The most loving person, this is the material here, the most loving person is the person who is self-centered. Neil adds a comment here and says that is a radical teaching. God continues, not if you look at it carefully. If you cannot love yourself, you cannot love another. Many people make the mistake of seeking love of self through love of another. Of course, they don't realize they are doing this. It is not a conscious effort. It's what's going on in the mind, deep in the mind, in what you call the subconscious. They think, if I can just love others, they will love me. Then I will be lovable because they love me. And then I can love me. This is a common subconscious chain of... Um, thought that we would expect to arise out of these circumstances based on standard psychology. Right? There are many other circumstances where we find that are relative to this same discussion point, not exactly the same. They think, if I can just love others, they will love me, right? Another one that I used to experience when I was in the throes of my own hatred for myself was that other people loving me would prove that I could love me. It's very similar, but again, it might take different shapes, it might take different forms, but the unconscious line here is something along the lines of justifying, using someone else to justify your own expression. And that's what um, we would, 
I, I mean, I would put in context of this whole conversation a, quote, wrong way of going about things, right? I mean, if that's your agenda, then that's your agenda and that's what you're aiming for, so that would then be right. Do you see how this works? If you choose to be not as we are discussing here, then it's not for you to turn around and say, this is wrong. It's for you to turn around and say, well, this is all well and good, but not for me. Okay? And that's perfectly fine. Continuing on. The reverse of this is that so many people hate themselves because they feel there is not another who loves them. Oh, that is my divergence here again. That is a powerful point to focus on, okay? So, so many people exist in their homes on a weekend, on a Sunday night, on a Friday night, on a Monday night, and they cry themselves about the place. Most would probably never admit that. But they do so because nobody loves them. Of course we are loved. Of course we are loved. I would slap anybody given the circumstance that wouldn't hurt or inflict pain and suffering on other people. <laughs> so slapping is probably not the best example, but <laughs> I would I would instantly be respondent to that statement by anybody in front of me or in reference to me, whether that was through a telephone or a webcam with somebody, I would explicitly state to them that they have no idea who I am or what I am, or how I am, or what I'm doing. And I would immediately follow that up by saying, I am love with and for you, along with everybody else. Let alone the fact that I do believe every single parent loves their child. I also believe that we have a fantastic way of programming our minds into negative circles or patterns of illogical reasoning and so we might find parents who claim that they hate their children but equally i would say to these individuals who say as much well what is it that you want you know and then go down the path of showing them that what we think we want is a result of the things that have happened to us in the past so how do they know that they don't want the love of their child or the connection with their child? And how do they know that they're not just trying the best to cut themselves off from hurt and more pain and more suffering, more expectation that is let down when others don't meet that expectation? And I think they touch on expectation very soon. Back to the material. This is a sickness. It's when people are truly lovesick because the truth is other people do love them, but it doesn't matter. No matter how many people profess their love for them, it is not enough. I remember as a teenager being upset because nobody would ever love me. I would never find somebody who would love me and I would never have a successful relationship. And which my mum would always comment, but I love you, Trev. And I'd say, yeah, but you're not my girlfriend. You don't care. So clearly people do love me under that circumstance. I was just encapsulating a micro-sized um, niche in order to misrepresent the collective, in order to fit the distrust and self-hatred that I had of my own. So I was doctoring circumstances, ignoring data, ignoring proof that was countering me incorrect stating that I, I was just deluded, right? I was doing everything I could to find reasons to justify why somebody would not love me, the whole time looking at my mum saying, no, you don't count, <laughs> you're a mum, you're meant to love me, you know? Thank you, mum, by the way. I love you too. First, they don't believe you. Right? These people who think that nobody loves them, when people obviously do. So you sit down and you say, no, I do, I am love for you to a random stranger or somebody under the circumstance, and at first they don't believe you. This is the material talking. They think you are trying to manipulate them, trying to get something, because how could you love them 
for who they truly are. No, there must be some mistake. You must want something. And what do you want? They sit around trying to figure out how anyone could actually love them so they don't believe you. They embark on a campaign to make you prove it. You have to prove that you love them to do this. They may ask you to start altering your behaviour or, and we're diverging from the material, or perform some feat of uh, love to prove it. Now, they're not going to take any evidence that you bring to the table because they're not looking for evidence of that kind. They've already got in their reticular activation system a set defined parameter frame reference point of what exactly they're looking for and it doesn't matter what you've got to offer if it's not matching that exact same design then be gone with ye and away ye shall go regardless of how much proof you have the cognitive dissonance is active and in full blow in these circumstances we all know about cognitive dissonance with recent events moving back onto the material I love this. Uh, one more point here. Uh, to do this, they may ask you to start altering your behavior. Secondly, if they finally come to a place where they can believe that you love them, they begin at once to worry about how long they can keep your love. So in order to hold on to your love, they start altering their behavior. Thus, two people literally lose themselves in a relationship. They get into the relationship hoping to find themselves and they lose themselves instead. The losing of the self in a relationship is what causes most of the bitterness in such couples. Two people join together in a partnership hoping to create the whole that will be greater than the sum of the parts, only to find that it's less. They feel less than when they were single, less capable, less able, less exciting, less attractive, less joyful, less content. And this is because they are less. They've given up most of who they are in order to be and stay in their relationship. Relationships were never meant to be this way, yet this is how they are experienced by more people than you could ever know. Okay? So, under the first point here, that they don't believe you, they think they're, that you're just trying to manipulate them. And then the second point here, that if they do come to that place where they can see you loving them, then they will immediately shift to a protective stance of possession, where they'll try to own you to prevent you from being able to remove their um, central spire of joy and approval of themselves. Right? So being the one who is able to stand at the height of one's own position to be truly rested in the self does not mean to be truly selfish in the usual context as in taking everything from everybody else for your own gratification even to the point where you're hoarding and hoarding resources and things away from other people where they're suffering because of your hoarding and you're not doing anything with it, you're just sitting on it out of your greed. This is, this is the circumstance that, um, I got distracted there again. Something grabbed my attention. But, um, that's, that's, um, that's the kind of circumstance that we, we don't want in a relationship. We want to be giving and we want to be open. We don't want to be contracted and in a state of fear. When we're in a state of fear in our own self, that's when we're trying to use external things to justify our own existence, which is my comment about commercialism earlier. Okay, If you're in a state of fear, then you're reaching out for what you don't have within. But if you can find or begin to assemble that thing inside of you that you are, love, compassion, understanding, and acceptance, and then you start to seek opportunities to show the world exactly who you are, that is to seek opportunities to be loving, to be caring, to be compassionate, to be giving, then you will live that as a reality at that point. Prior to that point in time, it's a concept of yourself that you're dreaming about. 
I'm pretty sure every narcissist would say, well, I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a bit of a judgment on my part, a male figure automatically being a narcissist. It happens across both sexes, across all spectrums of humanity, where we have people who consider themselves to be perfect rather than the problem at hand when they clearly are the problem at hand because they're deflecting all of their issues on everybody else all around them. So they're expecting other people to solve their own issues while never claiming ownership of anything and blaming it on everybody else at the same time. So I have no idea how long this has been going on for now. I'm going to call it at this point. This is only like the um, first one, two, three and a bit pages of the material but I've laid down together here a lot of framework for the rest of the context of conversation and I hope to explore this subject in more detail and to upload it online for your entertainment and your your exploration as well I need as I am only a finite measure of experience and perception as to where I am right here in my infinite capacity if I can gain the appreciation and perspective of those who are around me, then I can use those to find a more concentrated reference point of my relative um, reality, right? Which means I need your converse and discourse in this as well. So get in the comments and open up what is a relationship why do we have relationships are your relationships based in you justifying who you are or are your relationships based in having others justify who you are what relationships have you had that you've entered into that have been fantastic based on the fact that you've expressed yourself from the very moment or what relationships have you gone into trying to be the best that you can be for that person that has resulted in a negative circumstance. What would we call a negative circumstance? What are your teachings and your experiential learnings about this particular subject? Please, this is highly, highly valuable material. No, I'm not talking about the, the book. That is highly valuable and I recommend everybody get a hold of it. But I'm talking more about the discourse and growth that we can foster together in this subject, in this space that I'm raising for us all here, right now. So like, subscribe, catch my other material. Uh, you can begin the conversation. I will do the best I can, time allowing, to respond to all comments on my videos uh, to the best of my capacity. Uh, however, please keep in mind that I can be uh, and use a bit of my smart ass nature in my sarcasm under certain circumstances but i do the best i can to make that really obvious and not um detrimental to other people just more you know comical for reference point purposes you know. so thank you for sticking around to this lengthy discussion so far and um i wait i can't wait to hear what you've got to say on these subjects because yeah as far as it goes relationships are kind of one of the most important things in my life <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm full my life is full of fantastic relationships all over the board not just love romantic relationships with one other but i have daughters i have family i have partners who are exes i have a dead partner who i have relationships with who i have a relationship with I have a relationship with, you know, the divine creator, the one infinite creative source of energy that we call God, you know, or whatever we call it. But where are you on all of these subjects? These are big things. So let's get into it, shall we?